panelists. Today's presentation is how to perform IVIVC for delayed release drug formulations. This is the first webinar in a multi-part series. Today's speaker is Professor Jean-Michel Cardot. JM is a professor and head of the Department of Biopharmaceutics and Pharmaceutical Technology at the Auvergne University in France. Previously, he worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 15 years. JM has earned degrees in pharmacy and a master's degree in biopharmaceutical, statistical sciences, and pharmacokinetics, and a doctorate in pharmaceutical sciences from the Auvergne University. His research interests include biopharmaceutical development of drugs, in vitro dissolution, in, and in vivo bioequivalents, and IVIVC. JM, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to him to begin the presentation. Thank you, Suzanne. So now we are going to start with the presentation. I hope that the sound is clear for all of you. And I have to see how do I can you I have a small problem, Suzanne, to change the slides. Okay. Um do you see how to open the thumbnail on the left? Yeah. Okay, I see it here. Thank you. Perfect. I see yep. the now the, the button. Okay, sorry for that. So for the first of all, we are going to discuss about what is going to be with during this webinar. The first thing is going uh, to discuss what is IVIVC, and it's going to be very short because I'm pretty sure that you all know what is an IVIVC. Then we are going to see which are the various sources of viability, and as Suzanne stressed out, uh, this first webinar, it's the first of a series of three about viability, and today we are going to experience viability linked with formulation and physiology. And then we are going to see how to perform the IVIVC for delayed release formulation and to see how can Phoenix can handle this type of problem. So what is an IVIVC? IVIVC is a tool which is going to link together the formulation characteristics and the in vivo release characteristic of this formulation. From the formulation, you can have the release which can be studied in vitro, and that is an in vitro dissolution test. In vivo, when you have a drug which is administered and the formulation is a key factor of the release, what you will see in the blood is going to be the plasma concentrations, part is going to be linked with how the drug is going to be released and input in the blood, and the second part is going to be the elimination processes. In the case of IVIVC, what do you suppose? You suppose that the in vivo release of the drug is a limiting factor, and that can be studied in vitro. So the IVIVC is going to try to link together the in vitro dissolution and the in vivo release. What is important in this case also to keep in mind is that the IVIVC is a tool which put together the in vivo data, that means from something which is from the clinical department, the in vitro data which belong to the analytical department very often, or the QC department, and the formulation department which is going to take care about the formulation. All those data are going to be put together in the final dossier, that means with the help of the regulatory peoples. You can also use the IVIVC to fix the dissolution limits, and that is a quality aspect. And of course, as you need data from various departments, IVIVC is a perfect tool to make data management and project management. IVIVC, in reality, is something which is a little bit more complicated. You can see on this graph that you have a lot of graphics everywhere and a lot of possibilities. Why? Because very often, and we will see it, the IVIVC is not a straightforward relationship between vitro and vivo. You have to adjust the data. And adjusting the data does not mean that you have to change the data, but to try to find the link and the possibility also to shift, for example, the time or to make a scaling of the time. So when you want to make an IVIVC, you must first understand exactly all the problems. One of the problems is the viability. And the viability, you have it everywhere and has various sources. 
you have many variability that you may know, like the intersubject variability or the intrasubject variability. The intersubject variability is the variability that you have between people and between participants to a clinical study or a B study. That when you have a publication, it's very often the variability which is denoted by the standard deviation that you have after the mean value. The second type of variability which is important is the intrasubject variability. That means the variability within one subject. In this case, it's more complicated to have a evaluation of this variability and you know how to use it or you had already used it. For example, when you want to make a bioequivalent study to calculate the number of subjects, you need to have the intrasubject variability when you are in a crossover design. The sources of variability inter and intrasubject can be numerous. Among them, you have physiology. For example, your liver function between the people or even within yourself for highly variable drugs, the liver function is going to play a huge role. You can have a formulation which can be a source of variability. Your drug itself, that means the API. Of course, the analytical techniques that you are going to use for the dissolution, but also for the bioanalytics. And you have not to forget that all the algorithms has also some errors inside, and that means when you compute something, you will have an error which can be linked with the algorithms and its stability. How to solve it? You cannot solve always the variability issues, and that is a part of the problem. How can you take it into account when you want to set up IVIVC and prediction is what we are going to see now. As a source of variability between subjects, you have the age, the sex, the gender, the phenotyping, the habits, and so on. That is the source of potential differences between subjects. That means you will have high subjects and low responders, and that is going to influence the PK. And of course, if you are in parallel design, it's going to influence the values that you can have for the pharmacokinetic parameters. So it can influence the absolute and relative bioavailability and bioequivalence when you are in parallel design. But the difference of between subjects is not always a problem when you are in a crossover design, in the sense that a subject which is going to be high or low can be high or low for all the formulations which, which are going to be tested within these subjects. So you will have high responders and low responders, but among the formulations, they are going to be uh, homogeneous. So it's not a major issue, the intersubject variability, when you are in crossover design. It's problematic when you are in parallel design, or it's also problematic when you want, for example, to pull together two studies. For example, a first study that you had with some uh, pilot formulation and the final study that you have with the pivotal formulation. That is going to be studied in the next webinar. Intra-subject variability, it's something which is linked with within subject variability. Very often is linked with high first pass metabolisms or drugs which exhibit a high clearance, that means a high and fast elimination processes. In this case, you may have a huge influence or any small differences, for example, on your health rate, and that is going to modify the quantity and the blood flow in your liver and may modify at the same time your first pass metabolisms. So that is quite important in the crossover design because it's going to be based on the number of subjects that you are going to include within your study. But very often when you calculate the intra-subject variability, you calculate at the same time the difference within the subject, but also you include inside the analytical error as a source of variability within a subject. For this reason, bioanalytical error can be very important. Intra-subject variability does not include the difference between formulation, but only the difference within the subject. The intra-subject variability is going to be studied in the third webinar of this series. Now we are going to study things which are currently be linked with formulation and physiology. The formulation and the physiology contributes to the intersubject variability, but sometimes also to the intrasubject variability. That is the case of delayed release formulation. 
Why? Because the onset of the dissolution in vivo will depend on the pH and, for example, the fact that you are for gastro-resistant formulation within the stomach or outside of the stomach. That will depend also on the motility that you have in your GI tract. So in this case, the physiology is going to be an important source of variability within the subject and between formulations. What is a delayed or a prolonged release formulation? A delayed release formulation is a formulation for which the release of the active substance is going to be modified compared to the release of the classical immediate release formulation. And the modification is going to be a delay in time. That means the release is going to be similar to the immediate release formulation, but after a certain time. Very simple example is gastro-resistant formulation. For a gastro-resistant formulation, when you are in contact with acid, you don't have any release. As soon as you are in a neutral pH, you start to release, and you are going to release very fast, very close to an immediate release formulation. You have also something which is a little bit different, which is also a modified release formulation, which is a prolonged release formulation. In this case, the release is going to be made to sustain the blood concentration for a long time, and in this case, to reduce the number of pill intake per day, and in this case, for example, to have a once-a-day formulation compared to a twice-a-day formulation. Something which is quite important is that a delayed release formulation can be an immediate release formulation which is delayed in time, but can be sometimes also a prolonged release formulation which is going to be delayed in time. For the delayed release formulation, you have two major types, a release which can be made after the stomach or a release which is going to be made in a specific place in the GI tract. The first one is the enterocoated or the gastro-resistant formulation. This type of formulation are going to resist to acid and then you are going to have no release in the stomach. That can be made to protect the stomach for the aggression and the problems linked with the API or to protect the API from the acid. For PPI, that means proton pump inhibitors, for example, you have gastro-resistant formulation because the uh, prazole group is very sensitive to acid and is destroyed in acid. In this case, the release is going to start after the drug is emptied from the stomach, gastric emptying, and then you have something which is going to act as an immediate release formulation. So the release is going to be linked with the gastric emptying and your physiology. Depending on your state, you can have a release which is going to start 15 minutes after the intake because you have a fast gastric emptying, or for most of subjects or even within yourself, you can have a release two hours after, but depend if you are stressed, if you have drink something hot before or not. Colonic delivery is something else. You have some drugs which are coated and designed to deliver after a certain time, for example, two, three, four, five hours or six hours after the intake. In this case, the drug is going to be delivered within the colon. That is going to be based on time. You can also have this type of colonic delivery linked with pH or microflora that you have in the colon or some very specific enzyme that, you can ha are, that can be located in the colon. In this case, you have a delivery which is going to be delayed by hours. What is the common outcome of all those formulations? The common outcome is a lag time. And this lag time is going to depend about physiology, formulation, and subjects. This is a classical tablet delayed release. You can see that you have peaks everywhere. That means the Tmax is going to be function of the lag time. And the lag time is what you have in the bottom of this slide in the x-axis with a concentration equal to zero. You can see that some subject has a lag time of two hours and other subject can have a lag time up to four hours after a fasted drug intake. And due to this lag time, you have the impression that you have peaks everywhere. If I calculate the non-compartmental parameters, you can see that I have an AUC which is close to 4,000, and the mean of all individual CMAXs is close to 2,400. But now, if I make the mean curve, the mean curve in the bottom slide here is in bold red. 
you can see that the mean curve does not reflect all the peaks. The peaks are sharp for all the subjects, but in my mean curve, I have something which is not at all the same. Of course, the mean curve and the AUC under the mean curve is going to be very close to the mean of all the subjects, 4,000. But you can see that in this case, the C-max of the mean curve is 1,300, very far from the, the mean of all individual C-maxes, which are 2,400. If I start to use, in this case, the mean curve, I will have huge, huge problems because my absorption and, of course, all the derived parameters like the C-max and so on are not going to be simulated during my IV-IVC. So use of mean curve, it's a problem because it does not reflect the individuals. The AUC is almost correct. The mean curve smooth the C-max, and the lag time is not correct. It was one hour on the mean curve versus two hours in practice as a mean. That means the mean curve could not be used because it's not reflecting a mean subject, but something which was never happen, happening in vivo. Is that a problem for IVIVC? And among the IVIVC, we have level A and C. And we are going if that is a problem or not. For level C IVIVC, as I use the mean of individuals or I use all the individual value, it's not a problem. Because when I want to make a relation between my Cmax and my dissolution or my AUC in my dissolution, the values that I am going to use are going to be the value that I observed. The only point which could be of interest to predict could be the lag time or the Tmax. And in this case, to smooth the differences that I can have on the Tmax, I must use a parameter which is going to be the Tmax minus lag time. That means the Tmax corrected. In the small table here, the mean Tmax you can see is around three hours with a standard deviation of 0.9 hours. And if I use the Tmax corrected by the lag time, I can see that if I correct everything, that means if I shift all my curves, I have a Tmax corrective of one hour with a standard deviation of 0.3, if you prefer. I smooth all the variability that I had observed before. So the level A, it's going to be a huge problem. I have two possibilities. I can say, okay, I cannot use a mean curve. If I cannot use a mean curve, I can try to calculate the absorption, for example, of each individual subject. And we are going to see what is going to be the outcome in this case. If I use a mean curve and you have it on the left panel of this slide, you can see the black curve is the absorption derived of the mean curve. And you see the lag time and you see an absorption. And as we discussed just before, this absorption is not going to reflect that I observe the very sharp peaks because it's going to be smooth by the mean. So what I can do, and that is on the right panel of this slide, I can do each individual absorption curve for each subject. And you can see that in this case, I have 24 absorption curves. Those curves have different lag time. Some subject has a lag time of one and a half to two hours, and other subject has a lag time up to four hours. Now, when I want to make an IVIVC, I must use something which is a mean average or median value for the absorption. Why? Because if I use each individual subject to create an IVIVC by subject, I do not have a tool which allows me to predict a new formulation with new subjects because I'm going to be always linked with each subject. So I can make the mean of all individual absorption curve is what is said in the guidelines. And that will result on the left panel of this slide in the purple curve. You can see that I have something which is very close to my initial values, but not at all something dramatically different. So I have a problem. I cannot use the mean absorption. I cannot use the mean curve. I have to use something else. Something else which is going to reduce the viability that I observe and give me something which is closer to really the fast absorption that I observe at the beginning. So what can I use? To have less viability, I must subtract the lag time. So what I am going to do, I am going to use for each subject the time that I have observed 
minus the lag time observed for each subject. If you prefer, for each subject, I'm going to use the value that I observe and make a translation of my curve on, from the right to the left to have the first point, which is going to correspond to the last non-zero, the last zero value before the beginning of the absorption. The lag time being the last zero value begin be before the beginning of the absorption. We will see on the slide 28 how I am going to simulate the curves later on for my predictability. So if you prefer, what I am going to do? I'm going to use my raw data that I had from the beginning. And if it is on the left panel, I will have the subject, the time, and the concentration. I'm going to join that with the non-compartmental analysis, and mainly in this case, with one parameter, which is the lag time corrected for the non-compartmental analysis. In this case, this is the last column that you have here, subject, time, concentration, and T lag. You can see that at the beginning, I have a subject one, a T lag, which is of one hour. And at the bottom of this table, I start to have 2.5, which is the lag time of the subject two. The lag time of the subject one, you can see that correspond to the time one hour, correspond to the last zero concentration before the start of the absorption. So what I am going to do, I am going in this case to subtract the time observed by the lag time. That will result, of course, in some negative value. When I have time 0 minus 1, it's going to be minus 1. Time 0 0.5 minus 1 is going to be minus 0 0.5. Time 1 minus time 1 is going to be time 0, the new calculated time 0. And that will be the start of my new curve. So I am going to make that for all the subjects. How can I do it? I can do it using data wizard to calculate the time minus the lag time. And that is a very simple arithmetic function, x minus y. I am going in this case to recalculate everything, which is going to be the type correction. And here I have a very small part of the result table, subject 2 times 2.5, where I have concentration equal to 0. It's the first line, the line 17 the light time equal to 2.5, which gives me a new time, which is zero. Time 275, 213.66, light time equal to 2.5. 275 minus 2.5 give me the new time corrected of 025 and so on. Then in the second step, I am going to remove all the negative corrected time. And in this case, I will have a data set that I can start to use. So, what I have, I have something at the end which is more coherent. To have something which is more coherent means that on the left panel here, I have my initial data. You can see that on the initial data, I have peaks everywhere. When I have all my data corrected from the lag time, each individual lag time for each of the subjects, I have all the peaks which are almost at the same time. That means I have something which is more coherent between subjects. Of course, I have low subject and high subject. But the T max are very close together in this case for all my subjects. On the bottom of it, you have the mean curve. You can see that the initial mean curve, which is here in purple, had a lag time, then has a slow into quote absorption, as a C max, which was very low, 1,300, compared to the green curve, which is my new mean curve, which exhibit a very fast absorption at the beginning with a C-max which is around 2,000 something. My new dissolution, my new mean curve is more reflecting really the shape of all my subjects. Interpolation, why? Because I may have to interpolate. Now my problem is, as I have corrected each individual subject by their own lag time, but I may have subjects who do not have the same sampling time as the others. For example, here, you have something which is a table of the corrected time, which is the first column, the number of value observed, the old value, which was my initial data sets, and some remarks. You can see that I have 23 times zero. That means all my subjects, because I have 24 subjects minus one. 
And in this case, I have something which is quite common for all the subjects. For the time, a quarter of an hour, O25, I have only five subjects now which exhibit O25. I have 22 subjects which exhibit O.5 hours and so on. So you can see that if I make the mean curve, I will have a problem. I will have a problem in the sense that I will have not the same number of value calculating the mean curve that could result in something which is not going to be reflecting really everything. So what can I do? I can use something which is less influenced by extreme value like a median curve. But anyway, I'm not sure that it's going to reflect something which is realistic. What I can do also, I can try to interpolate the missing data and then to select the right time point. We are going to see how we can do it. How can we interpolate? Interpolation means that we are going to create new time points from the existing data. Either we can use a model and modeling, or we can use something which is a log or linear interpolation. What is a linear interpolation is something which is very easy. I have two time points with two concentrations. I want to interpolate between the two. I will calculate the difference between the two concentrations and the difference between the two times, which is going to give me the step that I can use between those two values. And I am going to interpolate, like if I make a straight line between the two, the missing value. Is that existing in Phoenix? Yes, but maybe you don't know that it is existing is nothing more than the superposition simulation, non-parametric superposition simulation. You need, in this case, to calculate two things, which is the most, smallest observed steps between two values. In this case, from the previous table, we have seen that it was 0.25 hours. That means a quarter of an hour. Then you need to, to calculate the time from the beginning to the end. That means how many samples you need to interpolate from which time span. In this case, I go from 0 to 12 hours. That means I need to have values every 15 minutes. I need 49 values. Be careful, it's not 48, it's 49. 48 will be correct if you start at 0.25, but you would start from 0. So that means you had it's an interval problem. You need to have 48 plus 1 to finish the interval. So in the simulation, in this case, you are going to set, I want to simulate from 0 to 12 hours, and I want to simulate 49 points. So in the setting for the interpolation, you are going to say that the dosing is a regular scheme, that you want to simulate 49 points using a linear method. You can use a log one if you prefer. That the loading and maintenance dose were of one, that the uh, interval between two intake is 12 hours from 0 to 12. And what you want to display, you want to display the dose number one and not at steady state. In this case, it's going to result by interpolation every 15 minutes of the missing concentrations. For example, in the right panel of this slide, you have the example for the subject one, where you have the time zero, and now you have a time one quarter, half an hour, three quarter, one hour, 125, 1 1.5, 175, and so on. He interpolate all the missing values. Now, what can you do? You have many strategies. You can keep all the simulated data. That means you are going to extrapolate a lot of data which are not existing. If your initial data set you have, for example, 15 samples, now you are going to have 49. That means a lot sample in addition. Of course, the Cmax and Tmax are not going to be influenced because that is the maximum value, and this one cannot be interpolated. The AUC will be marginally impacted by the new points. That means if you calculate the AUC as a linear rule, trapezoidal rule, is not going to be impacted. What you can do, you can select the simulated value. You can remove the points with a very low occurrence of observed value. That means, for example, that occurrence below 10 or below 20 or below 30%. If you have 23 subjects, below 10 means that you are going to exclude two subjects. And you are going to keep when you have only three points. If you take only for 20%, it will be five. 
you can also remove the point to be close to the possible schedule. For example, be something which is O, zero, half an hour, one hour, 1.25, 1.5. But in this case, your problem is that you have the fact that initially the sampling point were made in accordance to the possible lock time. In this case, you have also to shift the possible sampling time to be sure that you are going to capture the Tmax and the Tmax. So it's not so easy, and we are going to see now the impact of these possible selections. This is on the top left, the initial mean of individual before any correction. You can see that I have an AUC which is 3,961. I have a Cmax which is 2,410. And I have a T lag, of course, in this case. What do I have now? If I exclude the rare value, top right, I have, of course, the same Cmax. I have an AUC which is marginally impacted, 4,000. 17 or 4018. That means compared to the previous one, I have something which is a little bit higher by 57 on 4000, if you prefer something which is a little bit more than 1%. So it's not a drama. Now, bottom left, I keep all the data. I have also a little bit overestimated AUC, but around 1%. I have a perfect. Cmax. If I select now some possible schedule, you can see that my AUC may be better, but my Cmax is worse. So it's not so easy to see what I can do. We are going to see something else now, because that are mean values. If now I use something which is the XY ratio and difference routine, which is within Phoenix, I can have something which can help me to calculate what is good and bad. This is the three major things that I have made on the middle of this slide. I have the selected point, all point, is exclude rare value. I make the ratio AUC last re, uh, recalculated on AUC last observed for each subject, and I make the mean. You can see that in this case, I have something. My mean is very close to one, which is not so bad, but I have extreme value, which are the max and the mean values of those ratios. You can see that when I select point, I can have up to 37% of errors on my Cmax and up to 13% of errors on my AUC, which is quite high. When I take all the points, I have a ratio on AUC, which is 93% and Cmax, which is 100, quite good and I make only 11% of errors as a minimum value on the AUC, but no error, of course, on my Cmax. So you can see that selecting points, it can be a dangerous game. But two others seems to be less dangerous. So now we, are, we know a little bit more how we can simulate the points. If I continue, now I have something which is more consistent between subjects you have the mean curve without correction and the NCA without correction, and you have the mean curve with the NCA with correction. You can see that the errors on the Cmax is equal to zero, but you can see that my standard deviation, of course, of my Tmax is lower. But something which is more interesting in this case is to see the values on the mean curve. The value of your mean curve that you had at the beginning for the Cmax was 1,312. That means very far from the 2,410, which were observed. But now, if I take the Cmax of the mean curve compared to the Cmax that I had, the Cmax on the mean curve corrected by the lag time from the Cmax that I observed, you can see that my Cmax is 2,135 compared to 2,000. 410, that means I have something which is around 14% of errors and not 50% of errors. I'm strictly better. If I continue now and I want to calculate my absorption curve, if I have my initial data individual absorption calculated, which is on the left part of this slide, upper graph, 
you can see that I had a huge variability. Now, if I use the time corrected values to calculate my absorption on the bottom part of this curve, you can see that everything is more homogeneous. Of course, I don't have any more any lag time. You can see also that all the curves are very close and very similar, except two subjects, which are a little bit different, which is in this case the magenta and the yellow subject. Now, if I calculate the mean of all the individuals from the original data, which is in this case a purple curve, and on the time corrected value, which is here the green curve, you can see that I have something which is not at all on the same shape. My absorption is less sigmoid when I have my calculated, my time corrected values, and is more sigmoid when I have the non corrected values. That means even if I use the individual absorption curve when I don't correct by the lag time, the problem is that I will misestimate my absorption curve and I will underestimate my absorption rate, which can be of a great impact in this case on your IVIVC. So the level A in this case could be performed on the individual subjects. That means I can use the individual absorption, I can use the mean absorption, and I can make my IVIVC. And I will be able in this case to predict all the subjects. But how can I predict the lag time when I will predict? It's very easy. Because I can use in this case the predictions and I know that I have a mean lag time which was calculated at the beginning. You remember in one of the slides I told you I am going to discuss with the with uh, later on how to introduce to reintroduce it. And the reintroduction, reintroduction of the lag time is going to be made during the prediction, during the convolution. When I will have my convolution process, I will return a curve which is going to be my plasma concentration curve. Then I have only to add the mean lag time that I had at the beginning to have an idea about what is going on. We will see that also you have other way to reintroduce all the individual lag times. These type of problems, and we to see if we can use the mean of individuals or each subject, is going to be discussed in the two next webinars, which are on the intra and intersubject viability. So, take home messages. This approach allows to treat the delayed release formulation for, IV, for the IVIVC. And we can see the IVIVC of level A or C can be treated like this. What we have seen, we have seen that a level A IVIVC which try to put in relation the full absorption curve with a full dissolution curve, you have to correct by the lag time and to make a, a shift of your curves. We have seen that the level C IVIVC which try to connect together the PK parameters with some dissolution parameters, you do not need to correct it. You do not need to correct it. Why? Because you are going to use the values like Cmax and AUC, which are not going to be impacted by your lag time, which is not the case for the Tmax. What I have seen here is only a time shift approach. You remember in one previous uh, webinar that we had, we had treated the time scaling function. That is only an add-on to the time scaling function. It's a lag time correction. So also the outcome is that the IVIVC is possible for the delayed release formulation, which sometimes is said to be non-possible. If you have any questions, I am open to answer them. And Suzanne, it's your turn. Wonderful. Thank you so much, JM. As he mentioned, we would love for our audience to submit their questions to JM in the Q&A box on the lower right of your screen. Jan, somebody wants to know if you can, at a high level, explain the difference between IVIVC level A, B, and C. Okay. IVIVC level A is the more powerful IVIVC in all the definition of all the authorities. A level A is something which is going to try to connect together the full absorption curve that we have just seen here. That means how the drug is going to appear in the blood which is a curve going from zero to n percent absorbed. And you want to, correct, to connect it to the full dissolution curve. What you want to do is to have a one-to-one -one relationship after a time scaling or a time shift 
between the full absorption and the full dissolution curve. A level C IVIVC is considered by the authorities as less powerful, and we can discuss about it because that is not always the case. In this case, you are going to try to connect together the PK parameters, for example, the Cmax and the AUC, or Cmax or AUC, or any other PK parameters with an in vitro parameter. For example, you are going to say that the Cmax is going to be related with the dissolution that you observe after one hour. The drawback of a level C is that you are not allowed to predict a full, dis a full in vivo curve from the full dissolution curve, you can only predict parameters like Cmax and AUC and not the full shape of the curve in vivo. So it's considered to be less powerful. And if I remember, it was treated in one webinar some time ago, and you, maybe, Suzanne, you can put the link to this one. Yeah, I can share that. Great. Um, someone else wants to know, when you're calculating the lag time, what do you consider to be the important and relevant factors to take into account? So what is important when you have a lag time is to compare always the lag time to the full profile. If you prefer, the risk is that when you speak about lag time, some people are going to be scared because you have one hour of lag time in some formulations. But if you have a formulation which is going to last for months, one hour is nothing. And even if it's perilous formulation, if you have a half an hour or one hour of lag time, but your Tmax is at 12 hours, that means the lag time is not going to impact at all your absorption processes. And in this case, you can take it into account, but if you do not do it, it's not so important. Vice versa, if you have a lag time of half an hour, but your Tmax is one hour after the intake of a drug, that means any delay in the absorption is going to have a huge impact on your Tmax and on the mean curve. So what is important is always to compare the lag time to the Tmax. And when you have a difference which is more than a factor 10 or 5 between the two, you can say that the difference is not so important. That means if your Tmax is at 12 hours and your lag time is one hour, you can take it into account because it's going to be better. But if you don't do it, it's not going to be a huge drama. Someone asks, when, how would you deal yeah. with the situation when you have a lag time both in vitro and in vivo? Because the cause of those two lag times could be different. Yeah, and that is quite important because when you want to make an IVIVC, you have always to think that the in vitro, you are going to reflect the same thing like in vivo. I am not only speaking about mechanisms of release, but at least behavior of the formulations. So when you have a lag time in vitro and in vivo, you can make a time shift in both sides. That is a possibility, but you have to know why you have it. Of course, if you have an enterocoated formulation and you start with two hours in acidic media, it's sure that you will have in vitro a lag time because an enterocoated formulation is made to resist to acid. But if you have a lag time for a normal formulation in a normal media, you have to understand what do you have. And what you can do is to deduce the lag time in vitro for each point and in vivo. But in this case, you have really to try to understand why you have it. Very often, the lag time that you have in vitro is due to some physical chemical properties, either of the drug or very often of the formulation like, for example, to create a pro-system system or something like this. In vivo, it could be linked with physiology. Physiology is something that you cannot reproduce in vitro. And in this case, you have to treat them separately and not together. Okay? Someone asks um, for you to explain what multiphasic release refers to in enteric coded formulations. You can have something which can happen sometime. That means you can have formulations which could be biphasic release. That means even with enterocoated formulation or with classical formulations, you can have a, a release which is going to be a fast release at the beginning to, for example, 
have a faster onset of action, and then you are going to have a slow release later on. That can be also the case for coated formulation. In this case, you will have two absorptions. The first one, which corresponds to the immediate release part, which will exhibit, of course, a delay, and the second part, which is going to be for the slow release portion. And when you are going to study it, and when you want to correct it later on, you have really to distinguish between the two. Very often in this case, and you can make it with Phoenix, but also with other softwares, you use something to describe the absorption, which is not going to be a simple function, but very often a double or sometimes a triple variable function. That can be the case when you have this type of multiphasic releases. Very often multiphasic release can be fast followed by slow release or fast followed by delayed release, and the delay is to have a second pulse, if you prefer, of release. And that you have to treat in this case for the IVIVC sometimes separately for each of them because it's more easy. Looks to be our last question from the audience. Someone wants to know when the lag time is reintegrated into the final calculation, the variability is not included. Is that correct? Yes, it's correct if you use the mean lag time, which is the more easy way because you will reflect the mean curve. But don't forget that when you calculate the lag time, you can have a mean or the median if you prefer, but you will have also the variability. The variability for the mean, it's called the standard deviation. And you know that in the mean plus minus two standard deviation, you have 95% of all the lag time that you can observe in the subjects. Or when you use the median lag time, you can use something which is called the range. And using the range, you can calculate in this case the extreme values, which are going to be the minimum lag time, the maximum lag time, and the medium lag time. And you, will, you can, in this case, explain that what you are going to have is a T max and a lag time, for example, which is going to be between one and four hours with a median of 2.5. And you can also explain that the Tmax in this case is going to be between three and seven hours with a range which is going and a median Tmax which is going to be around these values. The same thing that you can do is with when you have a mean, you can calculate the distribution of all the lag times like a Gauss plot, Gauss plot, and you can on the same way calculate the, the distribution of all your T maxes using something which can be like a Gauss plot. So that means, of course, when you reintegrate very easily, you are going to use the mean or the median lag time, but you have all the tools in hand to calculate the extreme value that you can observe. Great, thank you so much, Jan. And thank you so much to our audience for all the great questions. Before we conclude our webinar, we have a few short announcements. The next webinar in the series will take place on October 16th when Drs. Eva Berglund and Julie Bullock will present U.S. and EU trends in clinical pharmacology for regulatory submissions. You can register for all webinars in the series by visiting sertara.com forward slash webinars. On behalf of Sertara, I would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. This concludes the webinar. Goodbye and have a great day.